Welcome to the Good Growing Podcast. I am Chris Enroth, horticulture educator with University of Illinois Extension, coming at you from Macomb, Illinois. And we have got a great show for you today. We have a grab bag of summer gardening questions. These are questions that have come into the Extension office, and we are answering them today. And you know, I am not doing this by myself. I am joined, as always, every single week by horticulture educator Ken Johnson in Jacksonville. Hey, Ken. Hello, Chris. It's been a while. I almost forgot. What we're supposed to be doing. I for, almost forgot what you look like, Ken. I, uh, just, uh, you've been off gallivanting across the uh, the Caribbean or the Caribbean, depending on uh, how you like to say that word. But uh, h- how how was the vacation? It was good. We did uh, some national parks in Florida. Went on a cruise. I can say I've done a cruise, and uh, yeah. So it's it's good to be back working through all the emails and stuff now. So. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Yeah. And so, yeah, you can say you've, you've done the cruise, you went camping in Florida, which sounds terrifying to me. Um, so that that's great. Did you have to look out for like alligators or pythons when you're down there? Um, so when we were camping, we were at the, uh, the dry Tortugas mm-hmm. over at, so we were in Fort Jefferson, which is about a two hour boat ride from Key West. So we did not have to worry about alligators uh, or pythons, but we did see some when we were in the Everglades and stuff alligators Mm -hmm. no no pythons no pythons no eight foot snakes slithering across the highway as you're trying to to get down to key west there unfortunately no no maybe fortunately no i I mean they're just like speed bumps you the florida kind of wants you to get rid of those things so yeah they got a bounty program on them yes or at least they used to i'm assuming they still do yeah well speaking i haven't gone anywhere i have i've stayed here in this office uh, since you left three weeks ago i haven't moved uh sleep here um but i i have had some things come to me from other parts of the country um namely my new pet um so uh i don't know the i might need to turn the the blur off the screen here but i don't know if anyone can see right here this here spider. Now there's also, I put a friend in there with him. That's a Japanese beetle. Um, I was really hoping that the spider would eat the Japanese beetle, but this spider was a, was brought into the extension office uh, by a person who went to Arizona. And as they were unpacking their bag, uh, when they got home here in Illinois, they found this spider in their suitcase. And like a good spider uh, person would, they didn't kill it. They put it in this jar uh, and they sent it to me. And so now I have this big spider right here and uh, it's going to blur. There it is. Look at that big old, big old spider. It's huge. I'm kind of surprised you got it intact, given how most people feel about spiders. Exactly. I know. I, that's why I said like a really nice, a good person who cares about spiders um, sent me this, this beauty right here. And so um listeners viewers uh i'm taking names for this thing right now um so feel free if you've got a name for this guy uh put that in the comments below uh uh, send us an email um i've given it all kinds of names and uh, but i keep forgetting what i call it so i need to to put a label on this thing um and i need to get it identified i have i've kind of gone through uh the old google just myself looking for uh, a way to identify this thing i can't find it so i think this is going to be an email over to arizona state uh extension to be like hey the spider came from you guys what is it <laughs> that's a pretty good plan yeah and, hopefully and listener, somebody knows what it is i hope so and they're not like ah it's probably a south american spider and i'm like well yeah, i really got a pet now yeah um <laughs> And, and listeners, if you're just listening, this spider, I don't know, Ken, how would you describe this? I would say it's its all two and a half inches across, massive body, might even be three inches, but it's its a big spider. Yeah, that's just the body. It does not include the legs. Yeah. A couple inches for just the body. Yeah, yeah. It's big. Uh, at first, I thought it might be a tarantula, but it, it, it is not, at least I don't think it is. It's not a hairy one, if it is, so... Uh, I'm not a spider person, so gotta go, gotta go find those spider people. Yeah, no, spiders don't bother me, but if I found that in my bag, I think that'd get my heart pumping a little bit. <laughs> you, yeah, yeah, and it would be more than just a rolled newspaper for this one. This would be a baseball bat kind of tool if you needed to dispatch it. 
Yeah, it, it and it would leave quite a mess if you smushed it. Yes. <laughs> it would ruin your your uh, uh, vacation. Sure. Whatever you smushed it on. Uh-huh, yeah. Oh, well, uh, Ken, uh, spiders aside, um, uh, this week we are, we're, we're combing through the emails and we are looking for uh, some good summer gardening yard landscape questions um, that people have been sending us. And so we do have a handful uh, for this week uh, that we're going to go ahead and answer. Uh, so, hey, why don't you go ahead and kick us off with our, our first question of the week? All right, so we've got somebody who is worried about poison hemlock near their vegetable garden. Should they avoid eating the vegetables because of that poison hemlock nearby? And a, a few weeks ago, I started getting a lot of poison hemlock questions. I don't know if there was some press release or something that came out that was carried by some major uh, media organization, but I had, um, I even had our local health department reach out to me about what's the deal with poison hemlock? Why are people so freaked out right now? Um, so I'm not aware of any national media attention this has gotten, but people have been calling about it. Um, so poison hemlock, uh, it's in the carrot family and it, it, it resembles a, you know, a carrot plant, but, but much larger than, than a carrot would be. It's a biennial. So that means it has a two-year life cycle. Uh, it's just a vegetative growth that first year, second year shoots up that big white flower stalk. And right now it's, it's July 11th. And so it, that flower has already bloomed. Um, right now, actually July 11th, um, our Queen Anne's lace is blooming, which a lot of people will confuse with poison hemlock. Queen Anne's lace blooms later though than poison hemlock. So, um, and, and Queen Anne's lace also usually has that little red flower uh, in the in the center of that cluster there so ways to distinguish the two now the problem with poison hemlock or maybe the reason why people are worried about it, it is very toxic um the plant itself if it gets in your body if you eat it can poison you <laughs> and it is the plant that when given a choice of how he would like to be executed socrates said uh, I drank what? No, he, he said, um, uh, I'll take poison hemlock. And so he, he, that's how he was executed. And that's, I think, the, the, the claim to fame of this plant. That's the one that killed Socrates. So the, as I mentioned, the major risk of this plant is ingestion. It's not, for most humans, it is not actually just brushing up against it like you would with poison ivy. You know, you get that oil on your skin and suddenly you break out in a rash. Uh, while parsnip is another example of a, a skin reaction. Poison hemlock is more of if I eat it, it will hurt me. So being near a vegetable garden doesn't necessarily make this plant dangerous. Um, I would say it would be a good idea to get the plant away because if it has flowered, it will be a setting seed and it will be throwing that seed all over your vegetable garden. So be a good idea. Take a sharp shovel um, right below where that plant comes out of the soil. Sever that uh, with that sharp shovel um, and, and remove that spent um, poison hemlock away from your vegetable garden. Try to, try to avoid spreading that seed as you're doing that, but uh, easier said than done. But I would just try to get it away from the vegetable garden. As far as I know, no toxic hazard in your vegetable would, would occur with your vegetables. But if you're not comfortable, don't eat it. I, I, I would just say that. And, and especially things like, like lettuces and broccolis, things like that, where I don't know, you can't really always clean those perfectly. Um, uh, maybe just get rid of those, but they're, they're really is very unlikely to be any hazard to eating those vegetables. Um, but if you're like me and um, I ate cow tongue for the first time, just the idea of knowing it was cow tongue made it not taste good. So uh, maybe it won't taste good for you. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. And I would say with, with that, even though it doesn't really usually cause contact dermatitis or any of that, still probably a good idea to wear gloves. Yeah. Uh, if you're handling that, just in case you, you do it, you do something else, forget to wash your hands and you get anything on your hands. You don't want to accidentally ingest any of that. Yes, yes. And, and that brings up another good point of kind of those other vectors that you can you can get that poison hemlock sap in your into your body. Um, uh, Ohio State University 
um, uh, I think it's Joe Boggs. Boy, that Joe Boggs, how does he have time to do all he does? Uh, posted a, a news story about someone who actually inhaled the sap when they were flail mowing an area where they had a lot of poison hemlock. Um, and so sometimes inhaling that aerosolized sap can also send you to the emergency room, which happened in, in the case that Joe Boggs ha had written from Ohio State University, which I'm supposed to say the Ohio State University, but I refuse to say the the or the the. Anyway, Ohio's a great place. Well, Ken, um, our next question is about uh, our, our sunflowers and tomatoes. And, and this uh, person uh, wrote or called in, I'm not sure which, the saying, there are red insects all over my sunflowers and tomatoes. What are they? And why are there so many? All right. So if you're if you're watching, we'll pop up a video or a picture right now of what they are. So these are aphids, and I don't know about you, but we've been getting a lot of aphid questions um, in the office. Seen a lot of stuff on social media. Aphids everywhere. Not necessarily red ones, but just aphids in general. Trees, shrubs, herbaceous plants. Uh, they seem to be everywhere this year, and. Speaking of Joe Boggs, I think he termed it the year of the aphid. Um, <laughs> and he, he did a, a good article again. Um, what is the name of their newsletter? Um, you know, BYLG I, or something like that? I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't know. Buckeye Yard and Garden Online. There so you go. That is, that's kind of the, the Illinois version of the Home Yard Garden Pest Newsletter. Mm -hmm. um, but he did an article on, on aphids. And one of the reasonings they're thinking why there's so many aphids this year is a lot of aphids are more cool season or they they tend to do better a little better in the cool season kind of had a prolonged cool spring this year so that allowed populations to to grow real fast the ideal conditions there are some aphid species that do not need to uh, mate to reproduce they give parthenogenically so females give birth um, without mating there are some that only eggs they give live birth so they're capable of very rapid reproduction uh, so you have ideal temperatures, rapid reproduction, populations just explode. And then um, we got real dry. And a lot of times we get nice heavy rains that will wash the aphids off plants, help reduce those populations. We didn't have a lot of that um, in Illinois and a lot of parts of the Midwest. So that also helped populations increase. Those cooler temperatures also slow down the development of uh, parasitoids, predators that would eat these aphids. So that again, that kind of got the perfect storm this year, it seems like. Uh, for for good aphid population uh, growth. So it's probably one of the reasons why we're seeing a lot of aphids on stuff. Uh, the reddish aphids, um, there's several aphids that, that kind of look like this potato aphid. Uh, it does have a kind of a pink form, which is probably what these are because they will get on tomatoes, um, potatoes, sunflowers, a lot of different types of plants. That's probably what they are. Uh, in a lot of cases, you don't really need to do much about aphids, you know, if you're out watering, knock them off the plants, like a strong stream of water. Obviously not too strong to knock your plants over, but knock those aphids mm -hmm. off. Some will climb back on, but a lot of them, you knock them off a few times. That do a good job of, of keeping those populations in check. Um, I've got some, we've got some aph aphids on some of our tomato plants at our Lukeman garden here in Jacksonville. Uh, and I was looking at those the other day. We've got lady beetles all over there. We've got lacewing larvae, lacewing eggs. Um, some predatory bugs as well, They're starting to move in on those plants. So I'm hoping within a week or two, we should see a, a little bit of a reduction in those populations as, as those predators and parasitoids start finding those, those aphids and, and kind of start clearing them out. Another option would be, you can always go the insecticide route. You know, if you've got them on sunflowers and those sunflowers are blooming, that may not be the best idea, um, or make sure you're not getting anything on those flowers or near those flowers. Uh, things like tomatoes, Again, if those are blooming, may not be the best idea, or do it in the in the evening when you're less likely to uh, affect those pollinators. But I'd say in a typical year, usually our, our predators, parasitoids, would clean that up relatively quickly. It may take a little bit longer this year, and depending on how large those populations are, they may they just may not catch up. So you may need to spray, depending on if you're seeing any damage uh, and stuff. And for me, I think it's cool, so I'm not going to do anything about them. I just want to see. <laughs> what happens, but I'm probably the uh, the oddball when it comes to that kind of stuff. Well, I, I think the lack of rainfall also led to 
the accumulation of that honeydew on surfaces, like everything underneath the tree, the spring just turns sticky because of all the aphid honeydew, which is their poop, um, that they suck the plant juices out of the leaf and then they excrete that sugary substance out and it makes everything below it turn sticky and sometimes grow sooty mold. And um, you'll even have ants that will start farming aphids. And I think that's one of the neatest things when I see that in the insect world, when I see an ant fighting off a, a predator, you know, it could be a, a parasitic wasp, it could be a lady beetle larva. Uh, so a group of ants will fight them off to, to protect an aphid because they're farming the sweet sugary honeydew coming out of their butts. Um, and, and I think that's just so neat. Yeah. yeah it's basically, but, basically cows for the, for the aphids. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. It's so cool. Nature is amazing. It's so amazing. Just, just ignore it's eating the plants mm -hmm. and making everything sticky. Yeah. Oh, well, uh, well, people have been calling me too about like aphids in their oak trees and, and yeah, I hate saying like, oh yeah, it, treat your oak tree with a systemic insecticide because there are so many other things that that eat oak trees that you will then affect. And so uh, my recommendation this year to people was uh, get a power washer and just power wash your, your oak tree canopy. I don't, I think it would, I, it would do a, a little bit of a trick uh, in terms of knocking off a lot of those aphids, cleaning off some of that honeydew or that, that insect uh, frass poop um, with minimal disturbance to some of those beneficial insects. And now that our rain has returned, we've really gotten into the heat of some of that summer. I'm not seeing as many aphids uh, this last about two weeks now. Yeah, and even when you knock off those aphids, you're probably knocking off your beneficials too. They'll, yeah. they'll come back. And with trees, if it's a healthy tree, you know, they can they can handle probably pretty good, pretty good load mm -hmm. of aphids and not do too much damage if any yeah and if it you know one year isn't gonna shouldn't kill a tree <laughs> <laughs> knock on plastic desk uh yeah um but, and, and aphids are so stupid anyway they they don't know how to get back up on the plant and and usually when you knock them off you don't you break their straw their 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 um mouth part yeah i guess that could be a possibility yeah I, but yeah and they just or they're on the ground and don't know where to go and there you go. That's the end of that. I call them the chickens of the insect world. Everything wants to eat an aphid. So just stop. Don't spray them. Let, let them get eaten. Exactly. Nature finds a way. That's right. All right. So our next question is a call from Galesburg about um, what this person called Asian or Japanese beetles. Uh, they've hung, hung bags all over, uh, but they're really worried about protecting blackberries. Is there anything, pest, any pesticide? That's safe to put directly on the bushes this time of year that won't make the berries toxic. Uh, they've got seven dust, which is probably carbaryl, uh, and some uh, Japanese beetle spray, but they're worried it'll make the fruit inedible. Hmm. Well, uh, and that's a, a, a great question. And let's start first with uh, the giant Japanese beetle trap in the room here. Uh, so Japanese beetle traps are the bags, as is put right here in the question. It's actually not recommended to use those, at, le at least not anywhere near the crop that you're trying to protect. Um, so the bags, what they do is they use um, they use both the uh, pheromone lures. There's two. There's the, the sex pheromone, and I think there's a uh, like a food pheromone, like a hey, here's the salad bar, kind of mm -hmm. come eat here pheromone. So they use these two uh, types of scent lures to draw in Japanese beetles. The thing is that it doesn't always draw them into the bag. It draws them in. They're like, ooh, hey, there's a crab apple, or ooh, hey, here's a blackberry uh, bramble here. I'm gonna I'm gonna land here and, and start eating because I got the signal. But the signal came from your trap, which actually just draws in more Japanese beetles than usually the traps wind up trapping. Um, so that's why they're not recommended as any any method of protection for a crop. Uh, the joke is always give the trap to your neighbor and let the Japanese beetles go into their yard as opposed to yours. So um, I'd say first thing, get rid of the traps and take those down because you're just drawing them in from the surrounding area. Once uh, that is done, um, we're talking about 
basically our, our post-harvest interval for any type of uh, uh, insecticide. Um, now, if these are healthy blackberries, and, and I, I will say, uh, when I've grown blackberries in the past, uh, I, I don't know if, if I could stop them. They, they sucker and they sprout everywhere. Um, so they're in a good spot. And so normally blackberries could probably overcome the damage being done by Japanese beetles. But if you're worried about this uh, and, and you do want to uh, spray something right now, depending on your variety, blackberries are probably going to be harvested either now or into July, sometimes August. And so you basically, whatever insecticide you choose, you have to read that label and follow that harvest interval. So it will tell you if you spray these, you have to wait this long to harvest this crop. And you wanna make sure that blackberries is listed on that pesticide label, that, that you can use that chemical on blackberries and that it treats Japanese beetles. And then find out how long do you have to wait. Um, when it comes to selecting types of insecticides, typically your organics, are going to have a shorter, and sometimes they don't really have any type of post-harvest uh, interval there because they are carbon-based because they're or it's organic chemistry as opposed to a synthetic chemistry or inorganic chemistry. And so those carbon molecules break down faster in UV light, which means they have a shorter uh, residual on our, on our fruits and veggies. Synthetics, typically they have a little bit longer residual on the crops or on the plants that we spray them on just because of the nature of their chemistry is that they're a synthetic or an inorganic compound. Um, so I, I would say, depending on scale, if you only have a couple blackberry uh, brambles or bushes to contend with, early morning, getting out there with a, a dish of soapy water, pick them off, drop them in, uh, shake them off into the soapy water, do that in the morning, do that in the evening. Um, and that should that should be your your blackberries should be okay depending upon their 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 health of the plant. So yeah, what do you think, Ken? It's been a while since I've answered a Japanese beetle question. Yeah, we haven't had many in the last couple of years. We yeah, had with your with your pre harvest interval and realize that you're going to have different pre harvest interval for different crops, even for the same chemical. So you know, just an example, it could be like seven days on tomatoes, but three days on lettuce mm -hmm. um, it's going to vary from crop to crop you know blackberries could also be called brambles the cane berries is being used more and more so that could be another name um, that can be on the end it's just going to depend on the product um and it's a little late in the season now but when they first start showing up from research that i've read if you can do a good job of, of keeping those beetles off the first couple of weeks that you typically have fewer problems later in the year it's kind of like those those traps you know when those plants get damaged they'll release chemicals that attracts the beetles the more damage you get the more beetles you draw on and you just kind of get this snowball effect if you keep them pretty clean the first several weeks you tend not to see as many problems down the line because you're not drawing in as many beetles um they kind of kind of get established so to speak in their areas and they don't necessarily get your plants that have been kept relatively clean so mm -hmm. if not this year next year if you keep on top of them when they first start showing up, you may have fewer problems. Uh, another option would be is you could net your plants. Um, netting would have to be small enough that beetles couldn't get in, so you're looking at fairly small um, netting there. Um, you know, you're not bird netting or anything like that. But you do also have to get your pollinators in there too, so that's a little. And, and hopefully they're thornless blackberries. Okay. Um, because that would not be fun to put nets over a, a thorned blackberry patch. Uh, oh, and I misspoke earlier. Thank you, Ken. It is pre-harvest interval. I said post-harvest. I'm getting my my food safety <laughs> terms mixed up with my my other uh, vegetable terms. So yes, pre-harvest interval. That's the thing you look for on that pesticide label. Usually PHI. That's how they abbreviate it. Yes. They're usually a big long table mm -hmm. somewhere. Okay, our next question is involving a, a, a house plant. Now, my house plants move outside for the summer, but um, but this is a Christmas cactus, and they want to know why is my Christmas cactus all wilted and shriveled? It's dying. Ken, is that all the information we have to go on? <laughs> yes. 
So oh, we got man. we've got we got a picture too. So we will. Okay. If you're watching. We will pop that up. Bing. Right now. Uh, so you can see the the leaves are getting a little little shriveled. Um, so this is one or two things typically. Either it's overwatered or it's underwatered, which <laughs> isn't particularly helpful, probably. But <laughs> no, <laughs> it requires a conversation with the plant owner. Be like, yes. how much, how often are you oh, watering? Yes. Yeah. Um, so if you're basically essentially the same thing as having the roots are getting killed and they can't take up moisture. Uh, overwatering, you're basically drowning the plant. Those roots will rot. You've got no root system. They can't take any water up. They start to shrivel up and wilt. No water enough, same thing, roots dry out, they die, they can't take up water, they shrivel uh, and start wilting. I would say more often than not for Christmas cactus, holiday cacti, typically it's gonna be overwatering. People tend to water them a little too much compared to underwatering. But yeah, that is a conversation you need to have with, or if you've got it happening yourself, you know, think about how often am I watering this? Let, if you're watering it too much, let those plants dry out a little bit in between waterings. Um, you know, if you're going a month or two without watering, it's probably not enough water uh, is your problem there. So I so I said all my houseplants move outside. I forgot I had one uh like some type of desert succulent cactus that was gifted to me by a a, a volunteer here at Extension. And I forgot it on the plant rack in the, the storage room in the dark basement. Totally forgot about it. Found it this last weekend. I'm like, it was all shriveled up. And I'm like, oh my. Uh, I threw it outside in an old kitty litter uh, bucket thing. It was full of water. It absorbed the water and it plumped right back up. That was amazing. I think it's. I think it might even bloom too. So um, it, I think I just set it through its natural cycle on on accident. Right, some time. Mm -hmm. And and people a lot of times with. With the holiday cacti, Christmas cactus, Easter cactus, Thanksgiving cactus, you know, a lot of people think of them as you know cactuses in the name. They're you know they don't need a lot of water, but these are actually you know more tropical plants. They're you know, found in Brazil and, and mountainous areas, so they do need a little more moisture than we would our typical cactus succulent that we're that we're thinking about. Mm -hmm. All right, our next question here is a homeowner uh, brought in some large green beetles. They were swarming around a shade tree. And they're wondering if they would kill the tree and if they can spray for them. Mm. So we also have a picture of, of these guys and we'll put them up right now. Uh, and these are actually, it's, it's like uh, the entomologists went, uh, their creativity went out the window today. The name of these guys is the green June beetle. Um, so it looks like a June bug, except it's green. And it's kind of has like a coppery outline on the the outer side of its 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 hard uh, shell covering uh, wing casing, um, and but but otherwise this beetle in terms of its its life cycle and kind of its behavior behaves a lot like Japanese beetle, but it is not nearly as destructive. Actually, um, green June beetle they seen that it, even though it it targets a lot of like. Uh, roots and detritus, things like that in, in the soil when it's a grub in the ground. It is so such a voracious eater, it will eat other grubs. It will eat like webworms. It will eat other meats or proteins. And so kind of has a little bit of a beneficial side to it. However, once they pupate as an adult, a lot of times they're attracted to some of our fruit trees, like our apple trees, and they might attack uh, our fruit trees, skeletonize the leaves, just like Japanese beetle, um, or attract our, our apple, the apple fruit itself. Um, but for the most part, I've never really seen them in a, a density that would necessitate spraying. And so I guess this would involve maybe more of a conversation with this client to see what is the shade tree that they are swarming around? And is there any actual damage? Because if it's a tree that is not a host plant for them, and if they're not actually seeing damage, there's no reason to spray. These bugs are just going to finish out their life cycle, lay their eggs in the ground, and call it a day for the summer. Um, so for the most part, I think they're a really interesting beetle. I think it's a, a neat to come across these guys. They can be destructive, especially some of our, our tree fruits, but um, I've never seen them in the density to necessitate control. I can, have you ever seen these guys at the level where you got to say, 
start spraying? Not green June beetles, like the fig eaters, which look similar and they're mm -hmm. related. I've heard of getting on fruit and stuff and causing some some problems, but you're not not the green June beetles. So we're going to take a quick break here and talk about the problem with common names. We've been talking about green June beetle and fig eaters, like they're different insects, but in this case, they're actually the same insect. There are a couple other insects that are referred to as green June beetles. This particular insect we're talking about, I usually refer to them and seen them referred to as fig beetles or fig eaters, but they are actually the same insect. So yes, green June beetle, fig eater can cause damage sometimes to on soft fruit, things like peaches, cherries, grapes. Usually uh, those, those fruit are a little bit past their prime. They're kind of ferment, almost fermenting. Uh, so they can cause problems on that if you get large clusters of them, but typically they do not cause much damage on plants. And with that, we'll return to our regularly scheduled program. Well, they usually only find one or two in a yard or something, and that's, a, that's about it. Um, and I know with this question, I think they're finding, you know, much more than that. So yeah, I think, I think, need to dig more into this and and figure out what is this shade tree that they're swarming around because again if it is an actual shade tree like an oak, oak or a maple or something like that it will likely be okay there's nothing that you really need to do at this point to protect that tree um and and but if it's a smaller tree fruit you know maybe maybe there's more management that needs to be done and i'm, I'm not saying this is the case but a lot of times with with insects, especially larger ones, you know, three or four is a, a swarm. Mm -hmm. So yes. that may be a, not saying that that's what's happening here, but sometimes people get a little, little worked up when it comes to larger insects. But, and that's true. You know, these big guys, these big guys take a lot of blame for some of the destruction of the little guys, you know, so uh, you gotta, you gotta keep that in mind as well. You see the big insects, but maybe there's, you know, maybe the tree's actually just covered in aphids. <laughs> we just they just don't look that close all right our next question is about oak trees and this one is an oak tree that has galls on the branches and some of the leaves are starting to turn brown and they're dying and there's also some dieback that's occurring on some of the limbs um this person said they looked up a few things on articles and it said that these were called galls and um that it won't kill the tree Another article said that it might kill the tree. It could, if there was a lot of them. Um, they've never seen galls on uh, on these branches before. So, uh, what should we do about galls on oak trees, Ken? So yeah, the, the galls on leaves. And if you've got an oak tree, I, uh, yeah, so you pretty much guarantee you're going to have galls uh, on the leaves. There's all kinds of things that'll form galls, and those galls on the leaves. You know, I've I've never heard of it killing a tree or, or really even causing damage. It's it's a good conversation starter mm -hmm. um, for people. Yeah. There's a lot of cool looking galls, shapes and colors, and you can go down a rabbit hole if you want to. Mm -hmm. As far as galls on, on oak trees, on, on the branches and stuff, I think there's kind of three main ones we have in Illinois that could be causing this. Oak bullet gall um, are smaller galls. Typically, they don't completely encircle the branch, so you don't usually get dieback. They're more northern part of the state. We have horned and gouty oak galls which will, will get galls on the stems and they will completely encircle the stem and that can cause dieback from that point of the gall uh, further down the plant. So more than likely that's what they've got is uh, horned or gouty oak galls. Um, I don't have any pictures of this one, so I can't say for sure. Um, but these, these are ca uh, caused by a wasp. The wasp will lay eggs in the leaf. They'll cause a gall. Adults will emerge and they will lay eggs um, in the branches. Those galls will, will grow, form, uh, eventually may grow together. And then you get this this larger gall on the stem, which will encircle it. Gaudio galls are, are kind of round and a little bit lumpy. Horned oak galls look similar, except they have little horns projecting out of there. And that's what the wasps are in, in that case. Eventually, those wasps will emerge, and they'll go on and, and lay more eggs. As far as management goes, really, the only thing you can do is, is prune those out. If it's a young tree, prune those galls out and dispose of them, destroy them. Don't just leave them around. Nothing really, you can really do to spray because they can come out at different times and you would constantly be spraying and it's probably end up causing more harm than good to, to beneficials and stuff like that. Uh, there are also parasitoid, there are also wasps that will parasitize these wasps that are forming those galls. So if you've got sure that's quite a few of them over time, those parasitoid wasps may move in and help clean that up. You'll probably get some dieback uh, on those trees 
uh, a little bit, but I would say it never happens, but it, it's not incredibly common to have a tree die from these galls. It, it can happen. Um, and there's actually, there's a couple of trees here in Jacksonville when I first started, uh, came out and looked at it and they were completely galled. And I think those trees did end up dying, but it was, it was kind of cool. <laughs> it was cool. <laughs> See there the number might of be other circumstances making them more susceptible to not being able to survive something like that. Yeah. And then, so, and then that you're, forgot to mention this earlier, the, the horn gulls, um, if I'm remembering right, I think those are more of a, a Southern Illinois thing and Gaudi oak gulls are more of a central Illinois. There, there's some overlap there, but depending on where this, this person was at, you know, that can help narrow down what they've got to, but typically they're not going to kill a tree. You may get some branch die back here and there. If you can reach them, cut them out. Otherwise, let nature run its course because there's not a whole lot you can do otherwise. I, I usually tell people that these are species, the, the tree, and then the wasp species that have co-evolved with each other. They're, they're native species. It's not like this is anything non-native that has been introduced. And so they, they, there is a balance there. And every once in a while, that balance gets shifted. Um, and, but, but they have co-evolved together. And so the tree should be, a, should be able to tolerate that uh, presence of the gall. Yeah, like you said, usually it's more of a a stress tree that's going to have more problems than a good good healthy tree. Mm -hmm. All right, we got our last question here. Another tree question. Uh, so, a homeowner has an ash trees has their ash trees treated every year by a company. This year, the company can't come to treat until late fall. Uh, they think that's going to be too late in the season, and is wondering if there's another solution they could try. So this is a, a good question and it can be a common question for people that that maybe they don't they don't notice they have a maybe they don't know one they have an ash tree or and then two maybe they're not aware of emerald ash borer um, which is pretty much widespread across most of Illinois these days um, and and so maybe they don't get uh, the the tree treated if they want to save that tree in the springtime which is the ideal window of treatment for ash trees because as the tree uh, goes through that leaf expansion portion uh, early in that that growing season it moves all that all the carbohydrates and waters and all the nutrients come up from the roots into the branches and a lot of and to protect those trees we put a systemic insecticide uh, that is absorbed also by the plant and that is able to move that upward throughout the entire canopy of that tree and that's why spring is the ideal recommended rec recommended recommended time? My goodness, it's almost close to the end of the show. I can tell already, um, and and so that's when we ought, will recommend to treat your ash tree. However, if you are late to jump on the ball, there are a few other options that are available. Um, now there is the option where people say, well, you can spray the canopy of the tree uh, like a foliar application. And uh, while that might exist, I usually would would not recommend something like that. I think it's it, it can be it's a lot of chemical being put into the environment that probably isn't doing much good. It's going to be expensive and you're going to cause all other types of uh, problems with other beneficials, pollinators, predators, all that kind of stuff. So I would avoid that foliar spray um, uh, for the canopy of the tree. However, you can do a fall application of a systemic insecticide uh, active ingredient that usually is used as imatocloprid. Um, uh, imatocloprid is the most common one that can be used by homeowners. It's also used by commercial applicators. Uh, and, but something to keep in mind, imatocloprid is systemic, which means it persists inside that plant. Uh, research shows that imatocloprid can persist for about a year inside an ash tree and sometimes longer. Uh, that, that clock or that, that half-life of that chemical in that tree is not definite. And so that's why we treat on an annual basis, but you might still get, have a little residual uh, insecticide in your tree this year if you have been treating for years prior. Now, one chemical, the, the one that I've used on my ash trees in my yard, the active ingredient is imamectin benzoate. This would be a good question for that homeowner, maybe to ask that company, what have they been using? Is it imatocloprid or is it imamectin benzoate? Imamectin benzoate has a residual of two, sometimes three years on a healthy ash tree. 
Um, and so if they have been using imamectin benzoate, you're good. You could also treat your tree with that imamectin benzoate in the fall. You're going to get a little bit of translocation, but then next spring, that chemical is then going to get pushed up into that canopy of that tree. So there, there are some options for you. There's also a basal bark spray. Uh, that active ingredient is called dinotefrin. Now that usually the window for that closes about mid-June. And so it's kind of too late for us on that one as well. So I would say if you've missed your ash tree treatment this spring, don't fret. If you've done it years prior, there's probably still some residual in that tree that is helping to protect it. You can then do you can do a, a mid-fall application of imatocloprid or emamectin benzoate. And that'll give you a little bit of protection, uh, systemic activity, but then next spring, it'll push a lot of that throughout that tree canopy. And so we can, there's actually a really good document um, on this that we can link people to. Um, oh, what's the title of this document here? Insecticide options for protecting ash trees from emerald ash borer. So we will we'll link to that document below in the show notes. Yeah, and if you've got a healthy tree, you know, missing a year shouldn't be a death sentence, you know, or doing it in the fall, it should be okay. If you're doing it every year in the fall, you may get yourself in trouble. Yeah. But if, if you miss a year or do it in the fall one year, it shouldn't cause too many problems. Shouldn't. <laughs> a lot of knocking on desk today. <laughs> it depends. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that MMectin benzoid, that, that is one that you as a homeowner, you know, if you're going to do this yourself, you need a license for that. And that's a trunk injection. Unless you know how to do it, you shouldn't be doing that yourself that's a yeah have a professional do that one for you that chemical is so expensive if you have one ash tree it is not even worth it for you to <laughs> buy the equipment become licensed and then buy the chemical um just hire someone to do it well that was a lot of great information about everything from the vegetable garden to, to our landscape shade trees today um, the Good Growing Podcast is a production of University of Illinois Extension, edited this week by Ken Johnson. A special thank you to Ken for hanging out me with. Ah, ah, oh, we're almost done, Ken. Here we go. The words are falling apart. Special thank you to Ken Johnson for hanging out with me uh, after uh, uh, just being a pirate of the Caribbean for the last couple weeks. So, uh, Ken, thanks for coming back after wrestling those alligators uh, and, and chatting with me. <laughs> No problem. I got all my digits still. So, and uh, yes, it's it's been fun. Let's do this again next week. Oh, we shall do this again next week. Ah, uh, did I hear a derecho uh, in the in the wind? I sure did. Well, Illinois, a large swath of the state has encountered uh, a derecho, and so we are going to be chatting with Emily Zweihart, horticulture educator up in the Quad Cities, about the tree damage that has occurred from that because Emily went through the same thing over in Iowa a few years ago. And so we're going to, we're going to compare ghost stories here about uh, what happened to our trees. And so it, it should be a fun one. Uh, so listeners, thank you for doing what you do best. And that is listening, or if you're watching us on YouTube, watching, and as always keep on growing.